Hi, I'm David Bader, Distinguished Professor and Director of the Institute for Data Science at New Jersey Institute of Technology. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker for the Data Science Seminar, Dr. Victor K. Prasanna. Dr. Prasanna is the Charles Lee Powell Chair in Engineering in the Ming Shi Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Professor of Computer Science at the University of Southern California. He is the director of the Center for Energy Informatics at USC and leads the FPGA and data science labs. His research interests include parallel and distributed computing, accelerator design, reconfigurable architectures and algorithms, and high performance computing. He served as the editor in chief of the IEEE Transactions on Computers from 2003 to 2006 and is currently the editor in chief of the Journal of Parallel and Distributed Computing. Prasanna was the founding chair of the IEEE Computer Society Technical Committee on Parallel Processing. He is the steering chair of the IEEE International Parallel and Distributed Processing Symposium, IPDPS, and the steering chair of the IEEE International Conference on High Performance Computing, HIPC. His work has received best paper awards at leading forums in parallel computing, high-performance computing, and FPGAs, including the ACM IEEE Computing Frontiers, the International Parallel and Distributed Processing Symposium, the ACM International Symposium on FPGA, FPGAs, among others. He's a fellow of the IEEE, of the ACM, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He is a recipient of the 2009 Outstanding Engineering Alumnus Award from the Pennsylvania State University and a 2019 Distinguished Alumnus Award from the Indian Institute of Science. He received the 2015 W. Wallace McDowell Award from the IEEE Computer Society for his contributions to reconfigurable computing. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Prasanna today, our seminar series speaker, and I encourage you to ask questions through the chat that we will get to at the end of the lecture. So without further ado, Professor Prasanna. Uh, thanks again, David, for a very detailed introduction. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, this is a talk uh, that, uh, that uh, I have put together here to look at um, how to accelerate some of the data science applications kernels at the edge. And the focus of this talk is going to be on using some edge computing devices such as FPGAs to get high performance. And uh, so the focus uh, will be to look at how do we exploit this technology for us to be able to solve these kinds of problems, data science applications at the edge. Uh, most of what I talk, uh, the publications, all of that you can get from access from my websites, uh, FPGA website, as well as the data science lab website that is uh, accessible. And then if you're also interested in the slide deck, uh, I will uh, leave this with the David Bader and uh, uh, he should be able to share that with you. So uh, this talk I have put together to first go through some work we do in data science lab and what are the issues in computing, um, uh, accelerating data science applications at the edge. Following that, I will uh, spend some time on FPGA technologies, uh, look at a particular technology that methodology that we are developing to accelerate applications. Following that, I will go through a series of examples to show how FPGA technology can be very effective in accelerating these kinds of data science applications. I have a lot of applications here. I will focus on a few of these applications to illustrate here uh, that we can get very high performance in using these FPGA devices. So let's uh, kind of go back here into what I mean by data science applications and what, what I mean by computing at the edge in this context. Um, as we all know, the computing landscape is changing. The application landscape is changing. I'm just showing some uh, very common applications that we are all used to at this time. Uh, in all these applications, the data is coming from everywhere, all kinds of sensor devices we have. Uh, we typically perform analytics in the loop. We collect the data and we make some computations on that. Uh, these computations are typically distributed. Uh, there is also a real-time requirement. We want to be able to look at these images and uh, make some inferences very quickly. And also this computation takes place anywhere, wherever the data is collected at the edge of the internet, and then you do computations based on the data. So in all of these applications I'm showing here, 
uh, this workload on the particular processor or the accelerator or the GPU or the FPGA that we may be using, uh, this workloads are changing. We are moving away from traditional workloads towards what I call as a, a data science workloads here. What I mean by data science here uh, is typical kind of problems, applications we have seen in this space, we are seeing in this space, a lot of modeling applications. The modeling here is very different than what happens in scientific computing, for example. Uh, there is some online learning that takes place, some training and learning based on those models that you have obtained here. You might do some prediction, or you may also be doing some optimizations based on those models that you discovered for the particular data sets we have. And this is a broad context under which we would like to see how technology could be used here to be able to accelerate these kinds of applications. When you look at these applications, uh, there is a large number of specific problems that come there in that context. Uh, when we talk about modeling, for example, uh, graph embedding techniques are used in that context. I will talk about how to accelerate uh, these kinds of um, data science techniques at the edge. Uh, when you look at the uh, various learning techniques, um, uh, today uh, reinforcement learning is becoming very effective at the edge. A lot of these applications, the optimizations are performed by using reinforcement learning techniques. Uh, the various prediction models are used. We'll go through some examples of how to compress these models, use FPGA technology in that context. Finally, various optimizations we do in the context of a particular application we have. For example, we may be doing some convex programming kind of applications to be able to get um, uh, optimizations inside the loop. So when we go back uh, uh, into these applications, we can break it down into various kinds of kernels. And if you look at what are those kernels, there's a typical set of operations that you repeatedly perform in those kernels, what I call them as building blocks here. Uh, the various kinds of uh, sparse or dense matrix uh, algebra operations you perform as, pa as part of some training operations or inferencing operations. Uh, when we are doing graph embedding, which I will go through in quite a lot of detail today, we do a lot of uh, a dense matrix algebra as well as sparse matrix algebra in that context. Uh, if we are looking at a specific building block like stochastic gradient descent kind of applications, uh, this is used in a large number of uh, training and inferencing applications. And also matrix decomposition is a very basic building block, uh, which is also used in the context of uh, uh, graph embedding or a PCA kind of applications where, where these kinds of matrix problems come into picture. So the way I would look at this is that we have all these uh, interesting applications at the edge, uh, the technology is evolving. And then given this, um, uh, these applications can be broken down into these kernels. And these kernels have this basic primitive or building block operations. How do we build these kinds of complex applications uh, at the end of the internet while also satisfying some of the real time requirements in those applications? So what we are going to be focused today is that if you look at all these applications, so traditionally a data was collected at the edge and the data is moved to the data center. You do your um, um, training or, or inferencing in, in the data center and then go back and uh, uh, pass those results or values to the edge devices you have. Maybe you have some cyber physical system uh, that is controlled in this kind of a data collection processing and all the way back to the edge device we have. So what we are going to be focused here is that maybe there are applications in which for various reasons, including real time requirements, including the need for privacy to be preserved in those computations. You might want to do these computations at the edge itself, meaning that you collect the data and use your resources at the edge and then be able to solve those problems. For example, you may be doing a prediction, you may be doing an optimization. You would like to do that operation at the edge itself. And for doing so, various accelerators, various hardware devices are used. And that is what is going to be the focus of the talk today. How do we use these kinds of evolving technology components? I've shown some examples here. Uh, I'll go through some of these hardware components in some detail. Uh, if you look at the computing platforms, uh, uh, CPUs, FPGAs, GPUs, uh, very high density devices are becoming available in the market now. On the left hand side, you see various memory technologies. Uh, these memory technologies provide extremely low latency, uh, very high densities, as well as very high bandwidth available to them. If you look at, for example, the high bandwidth memory, the 3D memory, uh, we can get uh, close to uh, terabytes per second access bandwidth available in these devices. What is also exciting in this space is that uh, there are newer interconnect technologies are coming into picture. I've just shown some examples here. Uh, there are on-chip uh, 
computing uh, communication technologies becoming available. There are newer, newer protocols and platforms are available for integrating accelerators and GPUs with the processors. Also, this notion of software defined networking where the user, the application has certain control in terms of the network performance. So these kinds of ideas in terms of computing, in terms of interconnections, in terms of memory technologies, offers us a very rich set of technologies and architectures to be able to exploit, to be able to speed up those kinds of data science applications I mentioned. For the benefit of those who may not be familiar with some of these technologies, I'll quickly go through these details here. What I'm showing here is a particular technology which we are going to be using throughout this talk, uh, which is the Field Programmable Gate Arrays, FPGA. Some of you may be familiar with this technology. Just quickly to make sure that we're all on the same page. I'm showing here a typical FPGA organization. Uh, what was typically the case, if you go back, say, about uh, 25 years ago, how this technology evolved over the last 25 to 30 years. The basic building blocks are what are called the configurable logic blocks, the LUTs. Essentially, you can uh, realize a four input function today or even a five input function by configuring those bits inside those logic cells we have. Along with that, we have a large amount of programmable interconnect resources, X and Y axis lines I'm showing here. Plus also there is on-chip programmable on-chip memory we have. The on-chip memory could be, for example, you can configure the lookup tables as on-chip memory. This is also what are called uh, static RAMs available on the device, block RAMs, M20K and what Intel calls them as. Uh, plus also there is a lot of external memory bandwidth available in these devices. So an important feature of these devices is that they have very large on-chip bandwidth. Uh, we can co connect these devices, communicate among these devices uh, at the rate of terabits per second on the device itself. So large amount of data parallelism, a large amount of bandwidth is available on these devices. So what I'm showing here is what I call here uh, two generations of FPGAs. I'm just showing here what is happening in the market today in terms of what are the newer devices in the market. Uh, this is a kind of a device that's currently available over the last five years or so, in which you have the standard FPGA devices I talked about. Plus you also have a large amount of static RAM I've shown here. I also show something here called SRAM Plus, which are very large capacity static RAM on these devices with some very special access features. You can do parallel access to these devices. Plus also we have what I call here as the hard IP core. Uh, you can get uh, a multiply accumulate units, you can get floating point units, you can get a DSP cores. Uh, today in the market, you can also get actual 32-bit processor cores that are available on these devices. So these devices have become quite sophisticated, quite a lot of external memory bandwidth that comes along with that, plus also quite a bit of connectivity in terms of uh, the PCI Gen 5 interconnects I'm showing here. So these are quite sophisticated devices. Uh, their computing power, I'll compare them against multi-core and GPUs next. As they have quite a bit of uh, uh, hardware features available here, which, are, which makes them an excellent candidate for accelerating uh, particularly data science applications. Just some example devices in the market today. I've just taken an example from two leading vendors here, uh, the Xilinx uh, Vitex uh, uh, Ultrascale Plus devices, and also the Intel uh, Stratix 10 devices. Uh, this is also currently available in the market. Uh, just a kind of a rundown of these features, very large number of uh, um, uh, fixed point units, what are called DSP blocks, few thousands of them you can get. Um, the tens of uh, hundreds of megabits of uh, on-chip memory is available, static RAM is available, uh, extremely high bandwidth in the range of terabits per second. Plus they also have a large amount of connectivity in terms of memory controller interfaces, DRAM interfaces, as well as the PCI Express interfaces available in these devices. And these devices also have a very large number of input output IO pins available. So you can in principle connect to various kinds of memory technologies, various sensor devices um, that gives you an opportunity for you to be able to collect data and process data at, at the edge of the internet itself. One more platform, just um, uh, example platform in the market today, what is called the, um, uh, the Xilinx the Zinc Ultrascale Plus, is what is called MPSOC, Multiprocessor SOC. What these devices do is that they have the programmable logic. They also have uh, some processors available on them, plus on-chip memory, on-chip block RAM, everything on a single device, They're specifically meant for looking at internet of things, IoT kind of applications. These are very popular devices in the market. They're very inexpensive devices, which makes them very attractive for some of the, from the edge, edge computing applications. 
this particular device here i'm showing uh, what is called uh, versal which is a very re recent device from xilinx uh, this is a complete heterogeneous architecture on a single chip and a single device single platform uh, which consists of multiple scalar processors i've shown here uh, the arm cortex r5 and a72 processors uh, quite a bit of what is called adaptable engines which are essentially the fpga device that we talked about earlier also, it comes with uh, DSP engines and AI engines. Essentially, you can do a lot of data parallel programming using uh, quite a large number of hundreds of uh, uh, risk processors available on a single device, plus a large amount of on-chip memory, plus external interfaces available. This is quite a, um, uh, uh, quite a impressive device here. That's a complete heterogeneous platform, heterogeneous architecture on, on, on a single platform. So moving along, what also makes this technology is very applicable at this time, and uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in this in the context of looking at the various interconnects available. The various interconnects here would be in the context of looking at uh, uh, the cache coherent interfaces. For example, we, I'm showing here a particular uh, CCIX standard. CCIX is a classic, uh, uh, is, is, a, is a technology that is becoming popular now. Uh, various vendors are supporting it uh, so that it becomes a standard technology by which we can interface processors and various accelerators, including memory technologies, including FPGAs. Uh, this is a, a community supported effort here so that uh, we can interface these devices and then have low latency and high bandwidth communication with the, with the host processor. One more technology that is becoming popular now is um, cache coherent uh, uh, memory interfaces. Essentially what this technology means is that you can share the host memory uh, between the accelerator, in this case, the FPGA device, as well as the processor, the DRAM can be shared in a cache coherent manner. So it is not necessary for you to make a copy of that, uh, like you do in the case of the GPU acceleration, the same memory can be shared between the processor and the accelerator, and that, that also gives rise to a large number of real-time applications to be enabled. For example, if you would like to do in a real-time application, you want to do let's say a privacy preserving transformation, if you want to do, for example, fully homomorphic encoding kind of applications, or if you would like to do some kind of a, um, uh, so some kind of a personalized recommendation system that, that a customer goes to a shop and within a matter of a few milliseconds or tens of milliseconds, you would like to make a decision and make a recommendation. For those kinds of applications, the memory transfer time becomes an important issue. And uh, these, uh, these accelerators today can uh, compute, perform these operations by sharing the data in the main memory of the system, uh, which can give you extremely low latency inferencing and applications supported based on that. I also would like to point out here that um, this technology I'm talking about, FPGA, FPGA acceleration technology, in fact, uh, it is becoming a uh, uh, quite popular in the data centers as well. Uh, various cloud platforms today support FPGAs, including the, the Microsoft Azure platform. So what I'm showing here on the lower left, uh, these FPGA devices are made as part of the, the network interface card so that you can build some kind of a very large uh, uh, FPGA uh, system, the FPGA distributed system uh, that you can program, you can accelerate your applications. So it's a very interesting concept that is being explored here in the context of uh, cloud platforms to get very high, pro very high processing as the data is uh, uh, passing through the network. So uh, looking at the software frameworks for this, uh, quite a lot of recent work in this space that makes these devices to be very attractive uh, is somewhat easier to use compared to what, what used to happen before. Uh, these platforms have large amount of library available on this. You can take these libraries, integrate them into your software flow, and then accelerate these libraries by using these FPGA devices. So there is quite a bit of work in the context of using what are called um, high level synthesis tools meaning that if you want to use this FPGA devices, it is no longer necessary for you to be a hardware expert. So conceptually, you know what the FPGA does, and then you can take your high level programs in C or C++, and then go from there directly into the hardware. That means you can get a hardware design starting from your software, which makes it very attractive for application developers and software programmers to be able to access this technology. I'm just showing an example here. If some of you are used to programming by using say OpenMP uh, programming model in which you take a serial code, a C++ code, and then introduce com uh, compiler programmers into it. Similar spirit, you can do that in the context of FPGAs today. So you can take a serial program, 
insert in that you know part of the code that you want to parallelize part of the code that you want to want to pipeline you can specify how much hardware resources you want to use in this process you can also specify what kind of operations that you would like to overlap with the memory references so i, I think by using these high level pragmas you can take code and then convert that into executable code on the fpga devices this is a very impressive technology which will uh, revolutionize in terms of uh, application developers being able to use this hardware device I'm just showing an example, something that uh, one of my students recently worked on to understand here how much time do you spend using uh, uh, using these high-level synthesis tools, and what would happen if you want to if you were to use some hardware resources in that context. I'm just showing an example that if you want to generate. Uh, by using the large number of DSP or the max available on the FPGAs, how do we generate a simple accelerator unit for matrix multiply? I'm just showing here that uh, by using this high level synthesis tools, uh, spending a few, maybe few days of effort uh, for, a, for a someone that who, who does not have a deep understanding of the FPGAs, uh, will be able to generate this highly optimized uh, designs for, for various uh, dense algebra applications. For example, various data science applications, you can generate very quickly on this. I'm also showing here that uh, uh, these designs uh, provide extremely high performance. I'm showing here that uh, uh, by using this uh, one of the Xilinx devices, I'm showing here for dense matrix multiplication, the kind of speed ups you can get here, a few hundred times speed up here by using a 32 by 32 systolic design for, for matrix multiplication. So where does it all take us? So before I go into the specific ways we would like to use this technology, I would like to make some comparison here, uh, looking at what is happening in the FPGA space, what's happening in the GPU space, and how do we compare these technologies in terms of the raw compute power that we can get out of these devices. So what I'm comparing here is the uh, Xilinx device that was just very recently introduced sometime in the last couple of few months, comparing that with the NVIDIA A100, which is also recently introduced uh, earlier this year. Uh, these, these devices are kind of, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, similar uh, compute capabilities and the raw capabilities we have, even though they're extremely, extremely different kind of underlying architectures we have. So in the case of the Versal Premium, uh, this is a very large device, uh, almost 90 billion transistors on a single platform. Uh, and then uh, in the case of NVIDIA A100, it's also a very large device, approximately 50 plus billion uh, uh, transistors, transistors on a single device. If you look at the raw compute power here, uh, keep in mind that the Versal devices, you can configure them for various bit operations. You want uh, binary operations, two bits, four bits, eight bits, whatever you like to have, you can configure them. I'm just showing here what is the typical peak performance that is there based on the device data sheets, uh, integer, integer rate performance in the order of a few hundred teraflops, uh, and also a similar uh, a slightly higher ratings for the case of NVIDIA A100. And if you look at the floating point 32-bit uh, precision performance, uh, so, so somewhere in the range of 20 teraflops that you can, uh, this, uh, that is a peak performance of these devices. The extremely large amount of on-chip resources in terms of static RAM or the L1, L2 caches you have on these devices, as well as extremely high bandwidth in these devices. So what I did here uh, in this next slide here uh, to just kind of compare these technologies uh, for the FPGA multi-core and the GPU, and uh, using some uh, some recent devices in the market here in terms of how do they compare in terms of their performance in terms of the hardware capabilities. Uh, typically for the FPGA devices, uh, they are fine-grained devices. Their operating frequency is not very high. Uh, the peak frequency I've shown here is around 800 megahertz. Whereas for the multi-core and GPU, it is, is, is typically uh, two to three to four times higher than what happens on these FPGA devices. So what is important to notice here is that these devices consume a, a lot less power and also they have a large amount of parallelism that is available on the FPGA devices because you're using this logic cells in parallel. Large number of these logic cells can be configured and they can operate in parallel. That's kind of what makes these devices to be useful for many of the applications where you don't need the full floating point operations or you don't need the full 32-bit arithmetic operations as part of, uh, for example, when you're doing a time series prediction, LSTM applications, uh, these are very highly suited for those kinds of applications. So, so before I go into the specific accelerators that we can build, I would like to kind of go through what is our approach here in using these uh, hardware devices. 
So the focus of this talk is going to be to look at those um, uh, data science applications, building blocks, kernels I talked about earlier, and then see how FPGA technology could be used to get high performance. High performance could be in terms of latency or throughput, or maybe in the case of graph analytics, number of traversed edges per second, how do we get that performance? The approach we take um, in my data science lab is to look at these hardware devices and the tools we have and we model them. Uh, we look at various models. I'll go through some example models. Uh, use those models to, based on the particular application, we choose those models and then uh, design the algorithm, the parallel technique to be used on this particular target platform using that model and then perform the mapping. Therefore, this is a hardware software co-design that we do here. And then after we do this design, we use the various tools, uh, high level synthesis tools, sometimes very log based designs, and then actually synthesize the design, uh, do the place and route, and then understand what is the performance you get in, the, in that context. So when we talk about models, uh, we are looking at uh, various models that we use for us to be able to design these algorithms. Uh, we can look at fine-grained models, looking at the level of the lookup tables we have. Uh, we can build, build pipeline designs. For example, we can build a systolic array designs to get very high performance for those uh, algebra operations I talked about earlier. Or we can also look at some of the external memory models to understand what kind of performance impact we have, particularly when you have very large data sets in the graph uh, analytics applications. So what is the impact of external memory, high bandwidth memory or DRAM on the impact uh, that, 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 that we would like to understand to devise these algorithms. Finally, we look at the the computation and communication trade-offs that comes into picture. And based on that, uh, we finally optimize the designs in that case. So the kind of the key feature that uh, uh, that is the distinguishing uh, uh, technology that we bring to the table is in terms of uh, making these designs to be rigorous. We make the analysis, understand the performance using these models and use those models to be able to drive our designs and get very high performance accelerator designs. So, so with that um, um, approach, uh, I will go through some examples. Uh, we have a number of applications uh, that we do in my data science lab and the FPGA lab. I'll go through some examples here to understand how this technology could be used here, exploited here for us to get high performance in these implementations. So one problem area, which is very widely studied, uh, in fact, a lot of work at NJIT as well, uh, in the context of um, looking at graph analytics problems. So, so we are looking at how to do these applications at the edge. And our interest here is to use, how do we use FPGA technologies in this context to be able to build these accelerators uh, that can get high performance in these implementations. Uh, for the benefit of those who may not be aware of these problems, graph analytics problems, you represent your data as a graph. And then we want to understand by using this graph, we want to understand some, uh, solve some problems. As part of solv solving those problems from an application perspective, you have various kernels that come into play. play. For example, I'm showing here the classic kernels are centrality, uh, computing distances, computing connectivity. Uh, there is also more recent interest in the context of using graphs for uh, uh, machine learning applications, what are called graph neural networks. Uh, also more recently graph convolutional networks. We will go through these examples. There is also a lot of interest um, in, 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 in the, the data being streamed into the architecture as the data is coming, as the data is changing, as the dynamic nature of the graph. Can we also estimate these properties, perform this analytics? It's a very important area of uh, research. Finally, there is also uh, going from the graph analytics to graph databases. Uh, there are commercial databases available today in which uh, uh, the, in the data is represented as graph and the queries are based on the graph analytics, uh, graph-based queries are performed on these. There's also a number of um, conferences that address this where graphs are used as a basic building block. And then based on that, you try to solve problems, uh, look at some applications based on this basic graph structure we have. So. Uh, when you look at these problems, uh, this, this graph uh, analytics problems can be computationally very challenging. That's where the accelerators, that's where the FPGAs uh, come into picture. I'm showing some examples of uh, various uh, graph uh, data sets that's available in the market today, uh, the various uh, graph databases that are available. So typically in all these uh, data sets, uh, they, we are looking at uh, tens of hundreds of billions of vertices and edges. Uh, these are extremely sp sparse graphs. And some of these graphs also also have some labels on the vertices and the edges. And these labels could be also vectors, for example. And that is the kind of problems that the graph analytics or the, or the deep learning based uh, graph analytics problems address, uh, address today. 
So, uh, so in this context, uh, we have been using FPGAs. Uh, in fact, this is a project that was funded by uh, Intel uh, to look at how FPGAs could be used uh, for, for graph analytics applications. Uh, the typical challenges we face here, a very large data sets we have. Uh, most of these memory accesses are very irregular in nature. We need to optimize the memory system performance, uh, very limited data reuse in these applications. And then some of these applications have very high computation complexity. For example, if you're doing machine learning on graphs, you're doing a very large number of operations per node. But before you have to, per before performing that operation, you need to sample the graph, which gives rise to irregular memory accesses in those implementations. But there is a lot of interest in this space. In fact, accelerators are being designed by using FPGAs. In fact, you can actually, if you go to Amazon F1 uh, uh, web services, F1 instance, or if you go on uh, uh, some other web, uh, web service providers, you can actually rent, you can actually take this IP course available for graph analytics, include them as part of your computation, and then look at the acceleration that you can get here by using this, this, uh, this FPGA accelerators that is available in, in the data centers. So I would like to go through one example here, how, how we use the FPGA technology to get very high performance for our graph analytics applications. This particular example we have here is focused on looking at uh, what is called the edge centric uh, computing paradigm here, uh, which is focused on, uh, this is a classic paradigm just for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with this. Uh, you read the edges, you read, you use the edges as the basic source that comes here, uh, gathers the information from the vertices from where the edges are originating from and use that information uh, through propagating through this edge-centric uh, computing paradigm to go and update all the destination vertices we have. That means you scatter the information from the source vertices by reading those edges and then collect the information that is a gather operation we are doing here. And then it, it store the information, update the vertex uh, vertices that are pointed to by these edges. That means you do some kind of an aggregation operation and update those vertices you have. There are a number of advantages to doing this. There are various techniques. Edge-centric is a very popular, very important technique. And there are many graph analytics problems are actually formulated uh, in by using this scatter and gather as the basic primitives in that context. Putting uh, conceptually in a graphical format, what I said, uh, that means you take these vertices in the scatter phase, you gather the, you take this information out of these vertices, that's what is this update information is going out, and then take all these updates here, and then in the gather phase, you combine them and update the vertex information in, the, in that gather phase. Uh, typically, this scatter and gather is repeated a number of times uh, before the algorithm concludes, converges to the final result. So uh, we developed FPGA architectures. In fact, uh, we have developed and uh, uh, some of these are also being kind of integrated into the Intel uh, uh, FPGA resources in Intel FPGA IP course available. So our, our, uh, our framework here, uh, so all the data is stored in the external memory. Uh, we also designed these memory controllers which are customized so that it has to be able to support the access pattern of these various uh, uh, algorithms, the edge-centric algorithms that I talked about. And then we have a large number of processing elements which are again configured based on the particular application that we have. If you're doing, for example, shortest pass, you may do certain kind of computations. Uh, if you're doing BFS, you might do a different kind of computations. Based on the computations, you, you configure these parallel pipelines, uh, schedule the operations, map it, and then make sure that uh, you optimize the performance in terms of uh, the total amount of time you take to solve this problem. So what we did in this framework is that uh, you specify the algorithm in the edge-centric paradigm, uh, which is based on the scatter and gather operations I talked about early, earlier. And then you provide your design parameters. For example, you might say, oh, look, I would like you to design it by using a high bandwidth memory uh, in terms of the available bandwidth uh, that, that you might want to use. Or you might also put some constraints. I would only like to use 50% of the target device for implementing this. On the left-hand side, I'm also showing that uh, when you, for this framework, uh, you specify the code, whatever is the C code, and then also specify the target platform parameters in that. And using that and the design constraints you have, you automatically generate a, a virtual architecture for the FPGA device for uh, executing this particular eccentric code. And then also this, uh, the, the actually generate the very large code, which can be um, synthesized as well as you can do place and dot and get a final design out of that. So uh, what is important here is graph partitioning, uh, that you have extremely large graphs 
And then uh, our main focus here would be to see, look at it to make sure that uh, the amount of time you spend in those memory accesses is uh, going to be manageable. That's one of the main important optimizations we do in this context. And then uh, when we do this in the target architecture, what I call as a virtual overlay architecture, uh, we build these multiple pipelines and these multiple pipelines are coordinated. What happens inside the pipeline is a very large code. It's automatically synthesized from your C, pro, C or C++ program. You have. And that means that you have multiple pipelines and then these pipelines are working on multiple partitions of the input. And then uh, there's a two levels of hierarchy you have in the optimization which makes sure that the bandwidth is effectively used and you can keep these pipelines to be active so that you get high performance, high throughput in those implementations. I just want to go through one detail of the kind of optimizations we do, the number of optimizations go into uh, uh, this again, uh, producing this uh, highly optimized uh, FPGA virtual architectures, which, which I will show you that get extremely high performance compared to CPU and GPU implementations. The important uh, Optimization here in this context is to make sure that uh, our DRAM is effectively used. Uh, when we use this DRAM accesses, uh, uh, so there is a large number of external memory accesses come into picture when you're doing the scatter phase as well as the gather phase. The advantage of using the edge-centric paradigm is that because these edges are going to be streamed in in a, in a sequential fashion, so their random access is, uh, the, the, they're, they're going to sustain very high bandwidth. On the other hand, when you're accessing the vertex information, uh, there will be irregular memory accesses comes into picture. So we do some optimizations in this context. What I'm showing here is that in the worst case, the number of uh, uh, DRAM accesses that comes into picture, uh, there's, a, there's a large number of random accesses. By that, I mean that, you know, and this these addresses are all going all around the memory here. I'm access location zero, the next instruction, maybe accessing location 1000 and so on. So these are not sequential memory accesses uh, that gives rise to low performance when you implement them on these target architectures. So part of the optimizations we did here is to come up with the optimal data layouts, uh, optimal partitioning strategies in that context to make sure that we can implement the edge-centric paradigm in this context. And I'm just summarizing a result here, uh, uh, which appears in one of our earlier papers I mentioned, uh, that it is possible to reduce the total number of random accesses, which can be very high. Uh, keep in mind this, this number of edges is very huge. And then we can reduce that, which depends on uh, a particular factor here, uh, which is the number of partitions. So this, uh, that means we can reduce it from, uh, from order of total number of edges. Uh, to the square of the total number of partitions you have. Partitions could be in the range of few tens or few hundreds. Uh, the size of the partition depends on the on-chip resources available on the FPGA device and also the total size of the data set we have. So this number of partitions is significantly small compared to the total number of edges. So by using this our data layout optimization, uh, which is a particular technique that, that gives, uh, gives rise to, uh, that significantly reduces the number of random accesses you have in this case. We also do a number of other optimizations, which is also done in the context of, for example, GPU and the multi-core implementations. One simple idea that has been explored in the literature is that uh, when you are communicating between the partitions, as you update the vertex information, maybe you can combine some of the vertex information if they are happening in the same iteration, if the data is currently available on the FPG device. So you can build some very simple combining mechanisms, for example, by using, uh, say, simple uh, Bitonic merge networks that we can use here. You can build those networks on the FPGA and get high performance in those implementations. So putting all these optimizations into a picture, uh, we get this complete architecture that looks like this. This is the virtual architecture that we interface. That's what is shown here as FPGA which is automatically generated by using our framework. And this framework, given the target architecture specification in terms of available resources, it automatically generates these pipelines. And then you map the computation onto it based on the C code that you provided as input. And that gives rise to high performance. Some more details here, the architecture essentially consists of multiple pipelines. Uh, and then there is also internal forwarding inside the pipeline so that you know the, we reduce the number of pipeline stalls in that process. And then that's what is a hazard detector is doing for us. And also we have an on, on, the, on the device, on the FPGA device combining network, uh, which takes these inputs. If multiple inputs are going to the same vertex, uh, the data is combined uh, before it is passed on uh, to the external memory. 
just some quickly some experimental results. All these results are based on a recent uh, FPGA platform from Xilinx, which is called the Alveo platform. Uh, these platforms are uh, used uh, in, in data centers, for example, uh, and they also have quite a bit of external memory bandwidth, which is very important for these implementations. So, uh, uh, so very quickly here, uh, we implemented various algorithms. These are all the classic graph analytics problems that is that is implemented. I'm just showing here uh, the kind of a throughput in terms of the traversed edges per second that you can get for these applications. I'm showing here for the case of the spots matrix where uh, multiply a ma matrix vector multiplication and page rank applications for various data sets, what kind of performance improvements, performance you can get on the FPG implementations we have. So what is shown here is for the week connected component as well as for the single source shortest path. I will later on compare these results with what happens on the uh, uh, state of the art results in the literature. So what we produced here is a virtual architecture. Therefore, we take the edge-centric C++ code and automatically synthesize this by doing these optimizations where we optimize the memory performance by using these data layouts. So what, what I'm doing here is comparing for the various uh, graph analytics problems, sparse matrix vector and page rank. And I'm also comparing that for the various data sets and also comparing against uh, the state of the art. There's quite a bit of work in the FPGA accelerator community in terms of accelerating this. And I'm just showing here what kind of throughput performance improvement we achieved here, a significant performance improvements we can get by using these optimizations I mentioned in terms of the memory optimization, combining network, uh, data layout optimization, and also partitioning to make sure that we fit the large size partitions on the device and reduce the external memory traffic in the process. Um, some more results here. Again, all of these results are comparing against state of the art. There is a number of papers in the literature over the last five years. Uh, we are comparing them to show what kind of performance improvements we can get uh, uh, by using these optimizations. Now, Again, I'll, I'll uh, quickly go to, these are all again the comparisons for the various uh, uh, results in the literature for the various data sets and the various applications we have. Now, this uh, the amount of speed up varies for some of these problems, for example, like page rank, a lot of optimizations have been done in the literature and we are comparing against that. For some of those uh, other results I showed, the data layout is very, very important. So in that context, you get significantly higher speed ups compared to what happened, what I'm showing here uh, in the context of page rank. So let me kind of conclude this portion of uh, uh, the thinking here in terms of using FPGAs. Uh, uh, so so what, what we did here, uh, this, this framework is available as open source. Uh, we, are, we are able to take these programs, C, C++ programs. Uh, these programs essentially are doing the scatter gather operations. You specify the body of the program and then specify you know, what is inside that. And then we automatically synthesize the code and do the data layout, generate the partitions, and then execute the code for you on the target FPGA device. What we also did is that we took those pipelines that we uh, generated for those our implementations and you worked backwards from there, mapping those uh, pipelines back to the processors. So in other words, look at the core of a, a multi-core processor as executing the operations that we perform in, in the optimized uh, FPGA implementations we said. So by doing that, we can also go back and generate um, the kind of go back in the reverse direction and then generate code for the multi-core platforms. And those, those codes actually do much better than some of the existing code on the multi-core platform for the same set of applications. We did the same for, for the uh, GPU designs as well. Uh, essentially take what is happening in a pipeline and execute that on a streaming multiprocessor. Uh, we, are, we are not having a large number of cores in the case of FPGAs. And then we do, uh, we do implement them, go back and implement those as streaming multiprocessors. And we get uh, excellent performance by uh, mapping these kinds of data layout and partitioning techniques back onto the GPUs. So let me move on. So I have a couple of more results I would like to share. Uh, so David, it's okay if we go beyond two o'clock? Sure, a few minutes is fine. Okay, all right. So um, I have a couple of uh, results I would like to go through, maybe uh, spend five to 10 minutes on each one of these results before we conclude and then uh, open up for any questions, if any. So um, I would like to now focus on some of the more recent graph analytics problems, uh, which are what are called graph learning problems, uh, in which we use the graphs as a way to train your uh, deep learning model. 
And then there is also issues about how to accelerate the training as well as how to accelerate the inferencing. There are a large number of applications are being studied today but for these kinds of graph convolutional networks. And there is there's quite a bit of interest in the machine learning community in terms of devising new graph convolutional network models. And then we are, we are particularly interested here in developing new techniques. I'll talk about a new technique that we developed for doing this, uh, which appears at the ICLR conference this year. And then uh, also talk about how to accelerate that te technique by using FPGAs. So graph embedding uh, is again a very, very important problem. It has become very important in the last several years. Um, essentially, you go, um, uh, essentially our interest here is to get a low dimensional representation for the graph structure. Essentially for every vertex you have in the graph, you represent that as a vector, a vector of a small size, maybe a few hundred elements in the vector. So the encoding problem, the graph embedding problem is given this graph, uh, to convert that into a, a vector space representation and then do the analytics in this vector space. That's kind of the very basic uh, uh, interest in using this graph embedding techniques. So one particular technique that we developed, what we call as the graph sync. Again, there is quite a bit of literature here in terms of how to train these deep learning models. And uh, this, uh, this, this graph sync is a particular technique we proposed. Uh, which appears at the IPDPS conference last year, as well as at the uh, revised version of that appears at the ICLR conference this year, which is based on sampling the graph, understanding uh, what, what input should be used in terms of training those uh, various, uh, train training the feeding the data to the various layers in the uh, graph convolutional network model there. And then we aggregate these features as we go through the various layers of the GCN model, and then you propagate this information by using the weight matrices that is there in for each one of those the GCN layers we have. So this is a particular technique that we proposed, uh, which is which is a sampling based technique. And then we have shown that this particular way of generating this uh, deep uh, uh, learning models are quite effective. So what I'm showing here is that for the various data sets by using this particular graph sync technique that I mentioned just now, that uh, we can get extremely high performance, high performance in terms of accuracy, uh, we can get superior accuracy, and then we can get faster convergence for these kinds of uh, GCN models. And then uh, also one of the concerns you have in of these models is that uh, as the model uh, depth is increasing, the number of layers in the model is increasing, you want to make sure that your technique is scalable. And uh, these this GCN models are also becoming deeper and deeper. So it is important to have the scalable solution for these implementations. And also that uh, we should uh, uh, also, uh, the sampling is very important. Uh, we should be able to also get the sampling also parallelized as part of the various uh, GNN implementations. All these graphs, which I'm not going to go into details, essentially uh, talking about how much training time you have and uh, how much accuracy you can get for the standard data sets in the literature, which is based on, for example, Flickr or Reddit or Amazon or Yelp or PPI data sets that's in the, in, in the literature. And then we are able to show that we can get very high accuracy, also perform this training very quickly in these implementations. So once you perform this training, there's a large number of applications that are being considered in the, in the literature now in which they use this inferencing on the GCN models to be able to look at uh, uh, some real life applications, including for example, detecting online fraud, uh, embedding techniques are used and in inferencing on that used to detect uh, uh, those kinds of, uh, implement those kinds of applications in real life. So what we are going to be focused here is that, um, is it possible to uh, take this collection of uh, GCN techniques that is coming up in the literature and then uh, generate a, a architecture here, a virtual overlay architecture, which can be applicable to the various the GCN inferencing applications uh, that is that's becoming popular at this time. So the basic operations that needs to be parallelized here are the aggregate function and the update function. So these are the key operations you do here. And then uh, when you do these operations, uh, the, the challenge here is that you need to go back and access the main memory of the system. You need to sample the graph, for example, you need to traverse the related edges at a particular node. And then that kind of sampling can also be expensive when you implement this, uh, this aggregate and update functions on, on the accelerator or the GPU devices we have here. So one particular technique that we developed here is to look at the classic graph partitioning techniques, but uh, uh, improve upon them by using uh, what happens if you have a feature vector. So when we have all these graphs, uh, these graphs are the classic uh, representation by using uh, uh, the various formats we have, uh, plus each node, each edge has got quite a bit of label information in terms of a feature vector that is associated, for example, with the vertices we have. 
So we developed a particular technique called 3D partitioning in which we take the vector, uh, the feature vector also into account while partitioning it. The interest, uh, the interest here is that by doing this kind of partitioning, we can reduce the amount of external memory traffic and also make sure that by choosing a proper layout, uh, we can ensure that the DRAM accesses are going to be sequential accesses, uh, which gives rise to very high um, sustained bandwidth when you access these large data sets in the external memory of, this, of these devices. Now, if you go to the heart of this problem, the, so the classic problem that arises here is the sparse uh, dense matrix multiplication. Uh, in the case of, for example, page rank, we do the sparse matrix vector product. Uh, in, this, uh, in the case of this graph GCN kind of applications, you are looking at uh, doing a large sparse matrix, which is the adjacency matrix of the given graph with all the weights. And then we also have this feature vectors, the weight matrix that comes into picture at individual nodes you have in the GCN model. And we should be able to uh, combine this to the aggregation uh, before that doing, doing, the, doing the multiplication for us to be able to, com to com combine the values and then aggregate the values we have. So, the, so this problem boils down to in the classic, uh, the, the key kernel to be optimized in the, in the case of GCN applications, uh, GCN training as well as GCN inferencing uh, is the sparse matrix uh, uh, times dense matrix multiplication. And then, uh, and then the classic problems in terms of uh, memory access cost coming into picture. Uh, this is a memory bound problem and a number of optimizations we have developed here to be able to handle this. So in this context, we evaluated uh, various um, uh, uh, sparse times dense uh, computations. Uh, again, we represent this sparse times dense matrix multiplication as a graph traversal problem. And then we look at the various paradigms available, vertex centric, edge centric. And also if you apply, for example, the edge centric paradigm, you, you get the edge information, you, you stream it, update, take the update values and then put them back into memory of the system we have. The problem with this approach is that we use a large amount of uh, extra memory space. The memory space that depends on the size of the matrix times the, the number of elements, the number of columns you have in the dense matrix. So if you have large amount of external memory, uh, this technique works. Otherwise, we need to go into other kind of techniques, including the vertex centric paradigms that have been used. So, so, what, so what we did here is to compare these kinds of techniques, what I call here as design one, design two, design three. Uh, these are based on uh, extending the classic edge centric uh, or vertex centric computing paradigms, and then augmenting that with uh, additional data layout, partitioning strategies, as well as making sure that if, if extra memory is available, how do we effectively make use of, use of them on the chip as well as in the external memory of these implementations. Just a quick summary of results here. Uh, we have done these implementations by using various data sets. I'm just showing an example data set. In the interest of time, I will focus on the lower left and the lower right uh, charts I have here. Uh, so I'm comparing on the lower left is the various techniques I talked about. Uh, and the horizontal axis is the number of columns you have in the dense matrix. And I'm showing here that the vertex centric paradigm in which we do communication optimizations by using our techniques, data layout techniques, partitioning techniques, that gives the best performance as the number of columns in the dense matrix uh, increases. On the right hand side, I'm showing here the comparison with state of the art. In fact, almost every vendor now provides these kinds of matrix libraries. In fact, they're also available as part of PyTorch Geometric was the deep graph library or with the DGL library. And also quite a bit of optimizations have been performed by the compiler groups. I'm also comparing here against the TACO group that has also performed large number of optimizations. So for the ELF data sets I'm showing here on the right hand side, I'm showing the execution time as a function of the number of vectors, number of vectors you have in the dense matrix. And I'm showing here that by using this uh, layout optimizations, partitioning optimizations, the 3D partitioning I talked about, it is possible to get significant performance improvement compared to what happens on a GPU implementations. And for the same data set, uh, for the, using the same amount of memory bandwidth, you can get uh, uh, better than 10x performance improvement for the various implementations on the GPU as well as on the CPU. And the specific techniques we are doing here is to be able to do this kind of data, data partitioning, as well as the data layout optimizations, uh, which ensure that the latencies are hidden and the external memory traffic is reduced in those implementations. 
So putting all this together, where we started in terms of a GCN inferencing, so we have a complete design for it, which does the feature aggregation as well as the feature transformation. Uh, these are based on by using the sparse matrix times dense matrix computations, as well as the dense matrix algebra that we do it on the on the FPGA itself. I've, I've given some details here. Uh, these are uh, these are available at my website. We also have the code available online if someone is interested. We do a large number of optimizations here. In fact, we developed some new scheduling strategies here to make sure that all these pipelines can work in parallel, independent of the sparsity of the graph structure. So there are some nice optimizations we can do here so that we can overlap the computation and communication and all the pipelines are kept busy uh, to get high performance in those implementations. Just a quick summary of uh, comparison results here. What you see on the upper right-hand side is what is the impact of these kinds of uh, uh, memory partitioning and data layout techniques I talked uh, on the overall performance of the memory system performance. So I'm showing here what is the reduction in traffic you have by using this uh, various optimizations for the memory data layout and, and the partitioning strategy. And I'm showing here as you vary the number of partitions, the number of 3D partitions is a parameter that we use in the implementation so that, that we reduce the traffic and then uh, uh, overall improve the uh, the, uh, the the in terms of the number of inferences per second or the amount of uh, the training time that we use for those uh, uh, GCN models. So in this example, I've taken a simple GCN model, a two-layer GCN model. On the lower right-hand side, I'm showing here for this particular model by using um, a 16 or 128 um, elements in the, in the vectors for the hidden layers for the two-layer model we have here. For the various data sets, um, I'm showing here uh, what happens by using those two parameters, 16 or 128 parameters, what is the uh, inferencing time for those implementations. So you will see here, there's a quite a bit of um, uh, implementations on CPUs and GPUs, and I'm comparing that with our work in the context of using the state-of-the-art FPGA device for it. Uh, we can easily go from uh, in the range of milliseconds to tens of microseconds by using this FPGA accelerators. There is also quite a bit of work in the designing ASICs for this uh, GCN implementations. I'm also comparing here. I'm also showing here what is the theoretical lower bound in terms of amount of memory accesses you perform. So the, critically, this problem is constrained by amount of external memory accesses we do. What I'm showing here compared to the lower bound results for this, what is the performance improvements we can get uh, by using this FPGA design. So let me move along. Uh, so I will take a few minutes here to kind of, uh, before I conclude the talk, uh, to look at, uh, there is quite a bit of interest in using this FPGA devices for low latency inferencing at the edge. In fact, this is a very important application area where, uh, for example, if you're doing reinforcement learning applications, uh, the typical batch size is small. Uh, the, because of the overheads in the, in the case of GPUs, uh, you, you, we are not doing batch processing here. So FPGAs become very attractive in these applications, whether you do it at the, at, at the edge or as well as in the data centers. So one important application area is uh, doing low latency inferencing for large CNN models or compressed CNN models. And that is a line of research we took here in looking at uh, how to get uh, very high uh, inferencing rates in that context. So uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I will skip some details here. Uh, what, I would, what I was going to show here as an animation here was in terms of what is the complexity of these models, typical models, in terms of the number of operations you do, and then what kind of model parameters come into picture. So our interest here is that to develop a framework in which uh, even though there are a large number of uh, these kinds of CNN models uh, with various input data sizes in terms of number of channels, in terms of number of layers you have here, in terms of the image sizes, we have, we would like to be able to have a generic architecture uh, so that we get uh, a low latency or high throughput with a particular latency requirement in those implementations. So uh, what we did here, a key idea that, uh, that we have been exploring here in this space is that uh, uh, why not we do these convolution operations in the frequency domain? Again, this is not a new idea. In fact, this idea is widely used in the signal processing community. Uh, by, by looking at the time series signals and then converting them into the uh, spectral domain, doing the operations in that, so that essentially we reduce in, in, in simple terms, we reduce the complexity from N squared to N log N complexity. And uh, that's the kind of idea we thought we'll apply here. So what it means is that uh, when you take the input data and then you partition that into those, uh, uh, those windows you have, 
these are overlapping windows you have. Uh, this is a particular type in which the, uh, we use the overlap and act technique in the fast Fourier transform community uh, to be able to reduce the total number of operations we do. So I call this as convolution layer in frequency domain. Therefore, uh, instead of doing this convolution operations, which are the most expensive operations in the CNN implementations, you transform that into the frequency domain, do the operations on the individual uh, uh, coefficients you have for the polynomial, and then convert that back by using the inverse Fourier transform into the, into the spatial domain. That is a key idea that we are exploring here. So uh, what we do here, that means that we take this. Uh, so our goal here is that give me a particular, uh, any of those CNN models that is there, VTG16 or AlexNet, whatever is the newer models we have. And then we do a series of optimizations so that we can go from the spatial uh, time series domain uh, to the image domain, to the uh, spectral domain, to the frequency domain, do all the optimizations in that, uh, all, the, all the computations in that space, and then come back to the, uh, the spatial domain we have. So as part of this, uh, we, are, we are doing all of the steps are automated in this in terms of uh, doing the fast Fourier transform, uh, streaming the inputs to it, doing all the operations in the frequency domain, and then getting the results back in, into the, the, the image data space that we have in terms of, for example, a classification problem we may be solved. So on the left hand side, I'm showing the various optimizations we do. Uh, we do frequency domain convolution uh, to be able to reduce the complexity. Uh, we do the overlap and add by doing so, we reduce the total number of operations we do by a constant factor. And then we also developed a particular technique called concatenate and pad that goes with the overlap and add so that by choosing the proper window size, we can also further optimize the constant factors in terms of the total number of arithmetic operations we do. And finally, we do frequency domain tiling here and then automatically generate the FFT pipelines uh, to be able to implement the complete CNN operations into a single FPGA pipeline. So uh, I know I need to conclude this talk soon, but uh, I will uh, quickly uh, summarize these results and conclude the talk. So what we are doing here is that this big picture here, we have the various abstractions for the hardware, we have the various models, and then we convert these models by looking at the spectral convolution as the basic uh, technique by using the fast Fourier transform. And then we also can apply in the context of FPGS various quantization techniques or, or pruning techniques so that we can uh, also improve the sparsity in this so that I can reduce the total number of operations. So by doing so, we have the compressed CNN models and then those models are mapped onto the target hardware by using the various uh, uh, design automation tools I talked about. So for this particular hardware mapping engine I talk about here, you specify those inputs, FPGA resources available, you specify the input data and the training data as well as the model, and using that uh, data, you convert that into the frequency domain representation and then do the retraining in that space and then compress and quantize the model and finally map it onto the FPGA device. Just some quickly some results before I conclude. Uh, this is showing here what is the optimized spectral CNNs that we could obtain on the FPGAs. Uh, these are all implemented by using the Intel devices. And then I'm just showing here uh, for the two cases of AlexNet and uh, VGG16 here, I'm showing the various FPGA resource utilization. What you would like to focus here is on the last row of this table where I talk about the throughput in terms of uh, number of images per second that you can do. I'm comparing here what happens on the spatial implementation that means not FFT is not used. And what happens if you do uh, our FFT based implementations and comparing that against uh, state of the art implementations for, uh, for, for this to for the AlexNet and VTG16. So I think the importance here is that uh, by using these techniques, by using our approach here, by using sometimes significantly less hardware resources for the same model, uh, we can get significantly higher throughput compared to the state of the art results here for AlexNet and VDG16. In fact, this is one of the best paper candidates at the FPL conference, the field programmable logic conference uh, that was held last year. So finally here, uh, so I also talked about compression. So one technique that we developed here is that uh, I want this framework to be able to specify in that framework, specify how much compression you want and then how much accuracy loss you are willing to tolerate in the process. Maybe I say, look, 0.1% loss is okay, but can you compress the model by 10X or so? So that is the context under which this, result was, uh, this, this research was performed. So we have tools here which will automatically compress that and map it onto the target hardware. Uh, this particular result appears at the HiPC conference last year. And I'm showing here 
If you do the frequency domain, that is, we use the FFT transformation, look at those models, compress those models, quantize those models, and then map them onto the FPGA device. And I'm showing here what is the performance improvement you're getting for the spectral uh, uh, domain compressed models. And the important metric to compare here is the throughput. I'm showing here our particular technique, I call this as the SPEC2 technique. Uh, in which we can get a significant throughput by compressing the model. Essentially, by frequency FFT operations, we reduce the number of operations by a factor of five. By compressing further, you get another uh, 10x to 20x improvements, and that's what you're seeing here in terms of the overall performance improvements you are getting here by using this uh, compressed spectral domain implementations. So uh, let me conclude here. Uh, apologize that I took longer than I planned. Uh, so, uh, so I, th I think the focus here as of this work has been uh, uh, this technology is becoming very popular. FPGA technology, uh, uh, in fact, it is also driven by the advances in memory technology as well as interconnects. And uh, these devices are becoming very popular in the data center as well as at the edge computing. And one important feature that that we have also exploited in some of our implementations is this idea of the coherent memory. That means the processor and FPGA can collaborate without having to copy the data. And also part of our implementations, we also exploit heterogeneity that I did not go into in this talk. Uh, we do have implementations for graph analytics where the multiple uh, multi-core in the, in, the, in the Xeon side is doing uh, some computations on the graph while we're also using the FPGAs to accelerate some portions of the work. Uh, that gives you very high heterogeneous processing uh, 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 implementations for, for, the, for this graph analytics applications. Finally here, all of this work is motivated by looking at low latency applications on the edge. Can we do these operations very, very quickly by using this, this uh, advanced, archit advanced FPGA devices? So let me stop here. Uh, this is collaborative work with my students and my team, and I also would like to thank my sponsors. And then I will stop here, and then I'm uh, open for any questions. So thank you very much, Victor, for a comprehensive talk about the hardware software co-design that goes into designing data science applications using FPGAs. I have a couple questions and we have time for a few, but if anyone on the call would like to ask a question, please type it into the chat. So maybe the, the first question I would ask is as a data scientist who is working on, on problems and using Python and um, current stacks, at what point would they decide to use an FPGA and how would they typically go about employing an FPGA to accelerate their workloads? So very good point, a very good question here. Uh, so a lot of uh, software tools are available for you as the end user. For example, I talked about the Xilinx Vitis platform, uh, which provides you these libraries. You can take your serial program, maybe you have a Python code, uh, you can take that, profile it, understand what segments could be accelerated, insert your commands, and then you can get a first level design working as an application developer to run on the FPGA device. So it's something like that is doable today. And, uh, and something like that can be doable today with uh, some understanding, very little understanding of the FPGA device. And you can do something like this if you want to get an implementation running in a matter of few days, if not weeks. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Dan Tong Yu who asked, did you get the GNN acceleration exclusively which, with HLS? Was it 10X over the GPU? That's a good point. Uh, so what we did in our implementations, uh, we implemented uh, the high level kernels, high level uh, interfaces after we do the aggregate operation as well as the, uh, the up update operations I talked about, the basic operations. So we implemented those two basic operations in very long. And then all the high level operations were in the high level HLS language that we had. So we, we took this approach because uh, almost 98% of the time is spent in those two basic kernels. And we wanted to get extremely high, highly optimized implementations. So we spent some time uh, doing that very long coding uh, by using those partitioning and the optimizations I talked about. Uh, that is a good amount of work, good amount of work for a graduate student who understands hardware. And then on top of that, we did the high level synthesis to be able to integrate that into the complete uh, uh, control flow in the, in, in the CNN model. 
So thank you so much, Victor. Great talk. I, I enjoyed learning a lot more about FPGAs, and I really appreciate you speaking today to all of us. Thank you, David. And then I will share the uh, slides with you. You're you welcome to share with the students or anyone.